Initiation by Robert Hugh Benson. Section 16. As they came down to the house again, Jim once more riding on Neville's shoulders, the physical pan-given ecstasy was still triumphing in the young man's heart. Aunt Anna met them on the lawn. She was just out of church and had come round, as usual, through the gardens on her way back. Will you repair, she said. It was indeed a joyous sight. Right on Neville's shoulders, without any compromise at all, sat her son. His bare brown legs came down over the young man's blue pajama jacket and were grasped there by a capable sunburnt hand. His white silk shirt with flapping sleeves was behind Neville's black curly head and just above it his radiant flushed face and golden hair. He was urging his steed on with a towel. And as for Neville, for all his six feet, he looked as much a boy as his rider. His black eyes were full of laughter. His parted lips showed his white teeth. He was barefooted, too, and his shoes were slung by string over his neck. There was a photograph of the Olympia group of Praxiteles in the morning room at Hartley. Inevitably, she remembered it, for this group was as astonishingly accurate translation of it into completely modern terms. It is true that Hermes wore blue pajamas and had a towel around his waist, and that the infant Bacchus was in white flannel knickerbockers and rode upon the neck of the elder god. Yet the spirit was precisely the same. It was a divine gaiety straight from Olympus itself, prancing on the lawn of an English country house. You, you absolute pagans, she said. Hermes' black eyes sparkled even more divinely. That's precisely it, he said. And you're only a poor Christian. How shocking. She glanced with a little quick movement of her eyes at the face of the infant Bacchus, but it was occupied with other emotions than that of Fairy's scandal. And we've been to find the Holy Grail, he said irrelevantly. He had no sense of the unities, it seemed. And did you find it? Cousin Neville said so, up in the woods. Go on, Pegasus. Bacchus beat with his bare heels as on a drum upon Hermes' chest. Don't, gasped Hermes, or I'll pinch them. He closed his strong fingers tightly on the little crossed ankles. Ooh, said Bacchus, and then his feelings overcame him, and he rolled his face passionately in the black curls into which his hands were thrust. Ooh, how jolly it all is. Go on, Pegasus, I promise not to kick. I think Pegasus had better, said Aunt Anna. The gong will sound in exactly three minutes, and I'm sure Pegasus hasn't shaved, and, and Bacchus must brush his hair. Bacchus, remarked Hermes, Pegasus questioningly. He looks like it. Go on. They were different persons altogether at breakfast, and yet the elder of the two children, as she said to herself, was no less radiant. But his radiance was of a different kind, and indeed a neat gray suit with a stand-up collar and thin shoes and clock socks have a very different effect from the pajamas, and are even less appropriate to Hermes. Jim, too, was indifferent. His hair had ruthlessly been brushed and resembled a neat oracle. He wore a holland jacket over his silk shirt and sandals on his feet. Besides, he was entirely engaged in eating an egg according to the proper ceremonial of grown-up breakfasts, and had no attention for anything else. He sat in an absorbed silence, scooping out the egg and putting it carefully into his mouth, rolling his eyes once or twice to intercept any possible criticism. "'I don't want to be brutal,' said Neville, "'but I feel like a schoolboy going home for the holidays. Why aren't there sausages? We always had sausages on the last morning at Stonyhurst.' "'Because it's Friday, my dear boy.' Lord, so it is, and I'm going out to lunch, and they're dining with me. Will Mrs. Ferguson remember? And if she doesn't, being upset with the journey yesterday and all that, may I eat meat? I think I shall require it because we're going to the theater afterwards to see Selva. Ever seen Selva? Aunt Anna nodded. Once, she said. She's, she's sublime, but I believe she's a most unpleasant person with a frightful temper, but she can act. They don't talk scandal, my dear. What does it matter what she's like, so long as she can act? That's what I've paid five guineas for. Or was it ten? I don't pay for her temper. I expect somebody does, though, observed Aunt Anna. Don't be so brilliant, Aunt Anna. It makes my head... He stopped short, remembering his little experience this morning. Ache, he added firmly. When he looked up, she was looking at him. Remember about the doctor, she said in a low voice. I shall remember to forget, said Neville. It's a sound plan. No, but, my dear, of course I shall go, if there's the very faintest reason, but I really can't go. If I go on feeling as robust as I do now, I'm, I'm bursting with health. He think I was insulting him. Start of subsection 5. The departure was a little melancholy for Aunt Anna. Neville's spirits seemed to rise steadily. He vanished after breakfast to see to one or two final things, and she heard him whistling in his bedroom, between snatches of conversation with Charleston. 
Then an aromatic smell of Turkish tobacco became sensible in the hall. I say, shall I want two white waistcoats? Charleston says so. She looked up from the Daily Mail, which she was pretending to read in the hall, and he was leaning over the gallery. Apparently, he had been about to come downstairs, for he stood now opposite the tall cornice door of his father's room. How can I tell, she said. You'd better do precisely what Charleston tells you. She wished she wouldn't stand just there. I mean, evening ones, said Neville. If you're going to be in town for three weeks, I should think you certainly will. I should take three. That's what Charleston says, but I draw the line at two. All right, Charleston, pack two. A discreet cough and a murmur of assent indicated that Mr. Charleston had been invisibly assisting at the conversation. Do you hear, Charleston? Bell Neville. Yes, sir, came sharp and clear through the open bedroom door. Go back to your room and tell him properly, whispered Aunt Anna. She simply could not bear to see him standing just there. It looked as if it was his own room somehow. I shall issue my orders from exactly where I please, observed the young man. Is that Masterson below there? Masterson came out from the drawing room. Masterson, you won't forget about my letters. Oh, I told you that at breakfast, and about sending up that trout if Dane can- Oh, I told you that too. That's all, Masterson. I forgot. Sorry. Aunt Anna went presently to see if the motor had come. The clock indicated that it ought to have done so, but there was no motor. She stood at the porch a moment or two, waiting. This was the rather somber side of the house, it will be remembered. The level flats of turf lay before her, cut by the straight drive, unrelieved by trees. The shrubberies on either side, especially the ipresses about the church, looked like troops of grave guardians of the right-of-way, like tall men waiting. Then she heard the motor coming round from the stables and turn into the house, hearing her name called loudly as she did so. "'My dear, what is the matter? Where's the motor? Why hasn't it come? Give Paul a month's notice.' He was standing again by the sinister door, whence through one of the hall windows he could command a view of the drive. He carried now a light coat over his arm and had his Panama hat on. Charleston, with a couple of suitcases, was waiting meekly for an opportunity to pass. "'It's just coming. Don't fuss, my dear, and let Charleston go by.' "'Sorry, Charleston. Is it really coming?' "'Oh, yes. I can hear it.' He was more radiant than ever as he kissed her goodbye. Jim had appeared with the collies, who also, it seemed, must be kissed on their long noses. This was accomplished with some difficulty in the case of Jill, who wanted to do all the kissing herself. "'Cousin Neville. Yes, my dear. May I come as far as the village?' "'Well, really, old ma'am. No, Jim,' said Aunt Anna firmly. "'Remember lessons. Besides, Cousin Neville mustn't stop. He's late.' "'Oh, very well,' said Jim superbly. Her heart was very low as the young man climbed into the driver's seat, and Paul, the chauffeur, went to wind up the affair in front. Yet she could not tell what she feared. That miserable passion of jealousy was at her heart again. It seemed an unbearable pain that he should go up like this, without her, in such tempestuous spirits. And he had scarcely said a word to persuade her to come with him. She mistrusted, therefore, every judgment. She told herself that she was wicked and uncharitable, that no one was without fault, that Enid, after all, so far as she knew, had as few as anyone else, certainly fewer than this hateful critical being which she called herself. But it was unbearable for all that. Don't look so grave, Aunt Anna, said Neville with his hands and their long gauntlets on the wheel. I shall go away and cry, she said, and then I shall probably slap Jim. Jim regarded her solemnly. Fasten those dogs up, she said, or they'll run after the motor. Jim twisted the long leash around one of the pillars just as Paul climbed up beside his master. Charleston and the luggage were behind. Charleston wore that peculiar air of humble attachment that quite perfect servants always do wear in such circumstances. The motor's roar had sunk to a rapid purr. Yes, the time really was come at last. He would be gone a full three weeks, she knew, and meantime, Jim and she must entertain one another as best they could. Jim really could get some lessons done. That was one comfort. He was beside her now and had taken her hand as his matter was. Don't drive too fast, she said. There's a lot of traffic near Croydon. Neville winked at her solemnly with one eye. Jill was beginning to yelp spasmodically. Jack had sat down like a monument. I shall drive like Jehus, he said. Then the motor moved off and Jill's yelps became heart-rending. Neville kissed his gauntlet superbly as he took the curve round into the straight. She stood there, watching. Jim, silent at last, was stroking very gently the inside of her hand, which he still held. Masterson was behind her somewhere, also silent. The principal noise, since it drowned all the others, was the piercing wail of Jill, who, with a nose pointed westwards, lamented the departure of the one kind of vehicle at which she always barked. Jack, still sitting, regarded the empty drive philosophically, growling now and again in the very lowest stratum of his throat. 
Far away now, down the dwindling road, was a dwindling motor. He was, indeed, driving like Jehu. A cloud of dust bellied behind like a continuous explosion, through which more and more faintly twinkled points of light where the sun from over the house behind caught the bright brasswork and polish. And then, as the last points vanished, she became aware that the noise of the dogs was quite unbearable. She turned and looked, and there they were both were, sitting together with elevated noses raising a common lament. Stop those dogs, she said sharply. Then she was ashamed of herself. Come along, my son, she said. We must go and learn our lessons.